Okay, so first thing I want to do today is I want to go over a, a problem or a couple of problems that, that we seem to have a little bit of issue with in terms of the structure of how to prove something. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with something really simple. I'm going to start with um, determine, not prove, because if you're asked to prove something, then you already know it's true. If you're asked to determine, then you're not sure if it's true. Determine if a shape is a rectangle then it is a square now first of all is this a true or a false statement if a shape is a rectangle then it is a square anybody want to it's Wait. not true it's false it's not true because you can think of a rectangle that's not a square is that right Yes. Everybody, okay, that's easy. So, but there the, are rectangles that are squares, though. It's just this not is an absolute. It's an absolute. It, that this is easy. The answer is no because you can find one. There's an infinite number of rectangles that aren't squares, but all you have to do is find one. In other words, it's absolutely always true, or it's not always true. There's no such thing as cases of truth. There's only cases of false. So. This is a false statement. We know this, but what's happening in some cases when we're proving things. We're starting in the wrong direction. So I've had several proofs that started like this. All right. Assume the shape is a, should be rectangle, shouldn't it? But I'm having people start by saying, assume the shape is a square. Let's start by assuming the thing I'm asked to try and prove. By the way, I'm now done. Just so you know, I, I'm not saying this jokingly. I'm now done. The idea was to prove my thing as a square. If I start by assuming the thing I'm trying to prove, then you're actually completely done with the proof without having said anything because you've just said, I've got it true. Now, through a series of steps, well, the definition of a square is a quadrilateral with four congruent sides and four right angles. But by virtue of having four right angles, that makes it a rectangle because that's the definition of a rectangle. So therefore, I prove this is true. No, I didn't prove this is true. I proved the converse of this is true. Oh, and I'm having a lot of situations where people, I'm, you're asked to prove something and we're starting off as our first statement by assuming the thing we're trying to prove and then working backwards and show, see, it works. No, you can never do that on a proof. You can never assume what you're trying to prove because first of all, absolutely it would be impossible for you to screw it up at that point because you've already assumed your conclusion. But secondly, if you are successful, you've only proved the converse. So let's, let me do another one. Okay, this one is a little bit trickier, okay? Determine if, let's see, sorry. If A divides, oops, sorry. If A divides B plus C, then A divides B and A divides C. We're gonna determine if this statement is true. So now let's start by suppose A divides B and A divides C, okay? Then there exists, let's say R and S in the integers such that, okay, A equals BR and C equals, what do they call it? Um, I'm sorry, B, A divides B, I, I didn't say that very well, hold on. A divides B and A div Oh, I did say that correctly. Okay, sorry. And A equals CS, too close to the board. Then, I said that backwards in both cases. Let me start that again. Ah. If, <laughs> if A divides B, that means that, sorry, B equals AR, there we go, and C equals AS. Then B plus C equals AR plus AS, which equals A times R plus S. Let T equal R plus S. It's an element of the integers because integer addition is closed. Therefore, A divides B plus C. Great. So I proved what I wanted to prove. Does everybody agree that I just proved what I wanted to prove? I just wrote this beautiful divisibility proof. So did I prove this is true? Ooh. 
Yes or no? What do you think, anybody? Why not? If it, uh, well, we'll use P and Q. If P, then Q, what did I start with? Assume Q and I concluded P. I just proved the converse of my statement. Turns out this statement's completely false. There's an infinite number of counterexamples. The number two divides three plus five, <laughs> but two does not divide three and two does not divide five. So again, my point being a lot of us are getting in trouble when we write a proof, not everybody, by starting with assuming the thing I'm trying to prove is true and then working backwards. And even if you are successful, you didn't prove the thing you wanted to prove. You can never start by assuming the conclusion. Again, it'd be hard to mess it up if you've already assumed that it's true. So make sure that you are going in the right direction. Now, this is not a monumental problem, but it does become a problem in general when a converse isn't necessarily true. All right, now today we're gonna go over some algorithmic stuff, like I said, it's pretty simple, but it's really kind of cool. I have fun with this. Now, let's go back to baby algebra. Heck, let's go back to pre-algebra. Okay, if I said I wanted the greatest common factor of two numbers, this in, in pre-algebra, we'd say find the GCF of how about 18 and 63. Now, in our class, we've advanced way beyond GCFs. We say GCD. We say greatest common divisor. It's the same thing. But all the textbooks use divisor rather than factor. So I will use GCD from this point forward. Now, remember, you've always, before this class, you always use capital I for the set of integers. And then when you get to this level, you use capital Z. I think it's kind of the secret handshake. You see, when I see a student write something is in the set of capital Z, then I say, aha, they know. Right. They've got that little extra inside of math. That they, they've got like the secret handshake that they now are using different symbols. Um, why do we change symbols? I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, in every statistics book you'll ever see written, when they use L-O-G, they mean natural log because you never use a base other than E in any context ever in statistics. Yet they don't write L-N, they write L-O-G and you're just supposed to know that. You know, there's, there's weird things like that all the time. And I don't sweat it. So what we did in baby algebra was we did the factoring tree. And this was absolutely correct. And as long as my numbers weren't really big, it wasn't terribly inefficient. So then I've got 18 equals two times three squared, 63 equals three squared times seven. And that's called the prime factorization. And I can do that for every single number, uh, every single, I should say integer. I can do the prime factorization. So when I'm looking at that, what is the most they have in common? Okay, that's, that's the key. The most they have in common is a three squared. So we would say, and now we'll all use GCD, and we write it like this. The GCD of 18 and 63 is in fact nine. Great. Now there's nothing wrong with that. But let me throw a what if at you. What if these numbers are really, really big? What if these are... Three, three digit numbers, four digit, but if they're five digit numbers, this process could take an absurd amount of time to try to do, especially if I'm doing this by hand, trying to do a prime factorization in general. I mean, you can't use your calculator for that. Good luck with that. <laughs> Ask your calculator to do a prime factorization of a 10 digit number. Even if it was capable of doing that, it might take a couple of days. I don't know. That's, that's not a good use of time. So there turns out to be a much, much faster, way simpler way of getting this answer that only involves div and mod because that's what we've been working on. So I'm gonna show you. And this is basically a simple structural thing. And by the way, I actually teach this without calling it such. I teach this in baby algebra. I used to teach remedial algebra and occasionally even pre-algebra. And I would teach this algorithm to the pre-algebra students and they, they loved it because it was so easy. It's called the Euclidean algorithm. Now what the Euclidean algorithm is designed to do is to get you the greatest common divisor of any two numbers. Now, 
A problem is if I have more than two numbers, then I actually do have to do the prime factorization of each one, unfortunately. But when you only have two numbers, which is actually the most common situation, it works really well. And so what you're going to do is use the div and mod and you're going to whittle it down. I'm going to walk you through the algorithm. The author does kind of a loose proof in the book, but I think the proof in the book is a little bit hard to follow sometimes. So let's say I have the GCD. Now, the way I like to write it, I always like to use the bigger number first. So then I have a simple strategy and we're writing it like this. Now, there is something I want to point out because some of us got in trouble with the zeros the other day. Zero is a tricky one. Remember, zero does not divide anything because that would mean the zeros in the denominator, but every integer divides zero. Okay, so remember that every integer divides zero. So if I said, what is the greatest common divisor? If I said in general, what is the GCD of A and zero for A being a positive integer? A is any positive integer, what is the greatest common divisor of A and zero? The answer would actually be A, because A divides A and A divides zero, okay? Remember, when you say A divides something, that means that A is in the denominator. A lot of us are still a little backward on that thinking. This is an absolutely critical notion right there, all right? So what we do is we start with this, 63 and 18, Think div and mod for a minute. What is 63 over 18? What is that? That's it's gonna... three. It's three with a mod of a a 10. Okay, let's just write it out for a second. So what would it be? It'd be three times 18 plus 10. 10. How about nine? 10, I'm at nine, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I got 10. Maybe I was doing 64 by 18. All right, so if this is the case, what I only want the stuff that's left over. I want the mod. So what we're going to do is say, now I have the GCF of nine is going to be one of my numbers. And now we're going to choose the smaller of the two, 18 and nine. So this is the algorithm. You find the mod. Now, you do not physically have to write this out every time. In fact, if you have a calculator, just use your calculator every time. Now you say, well, my calculator doesn't give me remainders. No, but if I write 63 divided by, I'm gonna get a decimal, then I can just multiply that back by the 18 to get my nine again. But I, I need this number right here, the mod number. Now, what is the GCF of 18 and nine? Well, 18 over nine is two. Oops, it's two with, Zero remainder, isn't it? Ooh, 18 over nine is two with zero remainder. Hmm. So if I said, what is the GCF of these guys? You'd say, well, I'm gonna move the nine over, but my remainder is zero. And what did we just say a moment ago? The GCF of any number, or excuse me, the GC, I wrote F, ah, sorry. I need more coffee today. GCD, that's, we're, we're, we're doing GCDs, we're, we're doing big boy stuff. GCFs are so, you know, algebraish. All right, what did we just say about the GCD of any number in zero? It's that number right there. Now we already knew the answer was nine, that's why I did it using a factoring tree, so you'd have a way of verifying. So the algorithm basically for any two numbers, you're gonna, after you, I always get, I go bigger, smaller to keep track, the next step is always going to be the smaller number and then the mod, the smaller number and the mod. At some point, you're going to get a mod of zero. You have to get a mod of zero at some point. And then that guy right there is going to be the answer every time. So let's do it again, but let's do it for some bigger numbers. Let's, let's do it so that we have to use our calculator because you, you can't be doing this in your head and you certainly don't want to be doing it by hand. That's just too much work. So I, I picked some really big numbers. How about... Um, I can read my own writing here. I want the GCD of 1,792 and 966. Now, I chose big numbers because I want to discourage you from making a factoring tree. That could just take forever. And, and the thing is, is, it's very, it's correct, but it's very, very inefficient. So right off the bat, 
I need to know what the mod is if I did 792, uh, 1792 over 966. So I'm going to get out my calculator and say 1792 over 966, and I get one point something. So that simply means this is one times 966 plus whatever the remainder is. Well, what do I do? I'm gonna take 1792 and subtract one times 966. And that tells me our remainder is 826. Okay, you can do this with any calculator. So that's the number I'm gonna use next. Okay, that's the key. That's my next step here. All right. Now, the next thing is I want 966 over 826. Well, again, that's going to be one point something. So 966 divided by 826 is one point something. I don't care about the one. I care about the point something. Oh, okay. So I'm going to take 966 and subtract one multiple of that. So this will be one times 826 with the remainder of 140. So I should probably circle these. That's going to be the next number we use. Okay, so I've got 826, 140. Now, you could all figure out how many times 140 goes in 826. I, I know you could all do that in your head rather easily, but I can't afford an error. So I just want to make sure. So I'm going to say 826 divided by 140, and I get five point something. Okay, the five is important because it tells me that I'm going to subtract five multiples in order to get my remainder. So now I've got, where is it? 826 over 140, okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm put, I should write like this. So that means that that, not the quotient, but that is that. So when I do this, I'm going to get the five. So I'm going to get five times 140. Now that's going to leave me a remainder of 126. Now remember the rule about a remainder. It can be any integer from zero all the way up to the div. It can't exceed the div. If I'm dividing by 140, I can't have a remainder of 200. If I'm dividing by 140, I can't have a remainder of negative 10. My remainder has to be a number between 0 and 140, 139. Okay, so then that's the next value I will use. So this now becomes the GCD of what? 140 and 126. Okay, this is getting kind of fun. Now, 126 only goes into 140 one time. And clearly I'm gonna have a remainder of 14. So this will be the GCD of 126 and, oops, sorry, and 14. I did that correctly. Mm, hold on, is that right? Did I do that correctly? Let's see, 140, 126. I think I did that correctly. All right. Now, what else do you notice? How many times does 14 go into 126? Nine. It goes in exactly nine times. Hmm. Is that a problem or is that a good thing? A good thing. It's actually a good thing. I'm going to write it like that. Because that means I have a zero remainder. So we like zero remainders. You know why? <laughs> it means I'm done. <laughs> I just don't know how to represent my answer yet. But when I get a zero remainder, that's a good thing because that means there can't be any more. So the next step is this is equal to the GCD of 14 and zero. Therefore, my final, by the way, I haven't actually answered the question yet, but it comes from right here. So that means my answer is. 14. So I didn't know what the answer was before I started. I'm pretty sure I did this right. I'm pretty sure. All right. I, you know, I'm pretty sure I did my taxes okay this year. I guess I'll find out later when I get audited. You know, I, I'm pretty sure that big structure I built in my backyard that's 10 stories high isn't going to fall down and crush my house. And my favorite, I'm pretty sure that stray dog that I'm about to pet doesn't bite. No, mathematics, there's no such thing as pretty sure. It's absolute certainty or nothing. 
How can I be absolutely certain that that's the right answer? Now it's your calculator. 1792 equals 14 times 128. 966 equals 14 times 69. And these guys have no common factors. How do I know they have no common factors? Because I got that answer in the first place. But if I wanted to try and do a factoring tree between these guys, I'd find they have no common factors. My answer is 14 because both of these have a factor 14 and 14 is the largest factor they have in common. Okay, it's kind of kind of cool. This makes it kind of easy. This is two to the seventh power. This is three times 23. I mean, they have no factors in common. So the Euclidean algorithm is particularly valuable when your numbers are large. Obviously, if I'm dealing with small numbers, I don't need an algorithm to do this. I, you know, if you said, what's the greatest common divisor of, you know, four and six? <laughs> you know, two. Okay, I'm, I can do that. I don't really need any help. But the idea is, if the numbers are large, and I have to do this, um, it could be I'm solving a big algebra problem. I have polynomials with really, you know, big terms or whatever. I, I need a way of analyzing large numbers. Now, there is one that gives us a little bit of trouble. Just one. <clears throat> so I want to define a term. You all know what a prime number is. A prime number is a positive integer greater than one that has exactly two factors, one and itself. Okay, It cannot be broken down into other prime factors. For example, the number three only has one and three, but the number four has one, two, and four as possible factors, and, and so on. So we, we all recognize how to write prime numbers. But what if I have two numbers? Let's use eight and nine. Okay, eight is two cubed, nine is three squared. We agree that eight and nine are not prime numbers. That means they're what are called composite numbers. I'm, I'm less concerned with that term, but that's the only other thing for an integer. If it's not prime, it's composite. If it's greater than one, one is neither. Okay, so why am I pointing these two out? Well, they have no common factors. Hmm. And so this goes way back to baby algebra. I don't know if you remember this, but if two numbers have no common factors, they still do have a common factor. One. Ah, everything has a factor of one. So if the greatest common factor of two numbers is one, I'm giving you a definition. If the greatest common factor of two numbers is one, then we say A and B are, and the term is mutually prime. Now that's kind of a tricky term. Eight and nine are mutually prime, but neither one of them is a prime number, okay? So mutually prime means they have no common factors other than one. What's the definition of a prime number? The only factors are that number and one. So in other words, it's kind of stealing from the definition of what a prime number is. So if I have numbers that are mutually prime um, and I don't know if this is part of the algorithm, but um, there are mathematicians who spend their whole life trying to find literally the next known prime number. And I don't know how many digits the current largest known prime is, but it's really, really big. So the question I have is, all right, maybe I've got a 20 digit number and I know it's prime. How do I know it's prime, first of all? And how do I get the next prime? Well, some of it involves using certain algorithms to be able to compare it to other numbers to see that you always have this common factor of one. Well, how does this look in the Euclidean algorithm? Well, let's do it. I've got the GCD of nine and eight, and that's gonna be the GCD of, well, look at this. Eight goes into nine exactly one time and we'll have a remainder of one. So this will now be eight one. The number one goes into eight exactly eight times with the remainder of zero. Oh, then my answer is going to be one. So this step right here is the key step. If you ever see this in your Euclidean algorithm, 
that means not only is your answer one, that means your numbers were mutually prime. It doesn't indicate that either individual number is prime. It just meant they had no common factors other than one. So since every pair of integers has a common factor of one, no matter what, if the highest common factor is one, we often just say they don't have anything in common because it's redundant to say, well, except for the number one. Well, yeah, they always have the number one, but they don't have anything larger than one in common. So let's do this process. How about four? Now, if I did a factoring tree, that might be more difficult from the simple reason of trying to find all the factors of 733 might take me a while. I, I you know, okay, let me get my calculator. I'm gonna try two, now I'm gonna try three, and I'm gonna try five, and I'm gonna try seven. You know, you keep trying until you got an integer result. That's, that's purely trial and error. That's not, that's not really good mathematics. So now let's see if we can do this in the air. 307 goes into 733, I'm pretty sure two times. And the remainder will be 733 minus two times 307. And that remainder would be 119. So the mod between those two numbers would be 119. Now, again, these numbers aren't outrageous. I can do this. I can see 119 is gonna go into this twice, okay? So when I do that, my mod will be 307 minus two times 119, and my mod would be 69, okay? Now, if the numbers are really large, I'm gonna use my calculator and, and do the division and see what integer value I get, and then I'm gonna do the same thing. 69 clearly goes into this once, and I believe we can all see the remainder will be 50. So 69, 50. Again, we can see that 50 goes into 69 exactly one time, and that will have a remainder of 19. Okay, 19 goes into 50 exactly two times. And again, I can always use my calculator to figure that out. And 50 minus two times 19 would be 12. 12 goes into 19 exactly once, and 19 times 12, or 19 minus 12 would be seven. We're getting there. Seven goes into 12 exactly one time, and 12 minus seven is five. <laughs> I'll fit one of mine here. Five goes into seven exactly one time with a remainder of two. Oy vey. All right. Two goes into five two times. And I'm going to have a remainder of one because five minus two times two is one. And finally, one goes into two twice with zero remainder. We are done. Oh my gosh. Those two numbers were mutually prime before we even started the problem. But if those had been four, five, six, seven digit numbers, this is not a fast process, but it's way faster than trying to do a factoring tree. Okay, so this is the Euclidean algorithm. It's actually that simple. So what I want to do, I'm going to give you guys one problem on your own. And let's see if we can uh, kind of hammer our way through the problem. Okay, let me write it down here. Um, hold on one sec. All right, as a group, let's try to write it in words. Find the GCD of sorry, I can't read my own right. 1392 and 624. So I'd like you all to try the algorithm. So I'm going to pause this while we're working. All right, from what I can see that most of you, what you showed me was, was good stuff. This is a new process, so it'll take us a little longer to get, to get the hang of it. So the question is, what is the, um, the GCD of 1392 and 624? So I don't need to do this in my head. I can use my calculator, and I'll see that 624 goes into that two times with the remainder. 
So 1392 minus two times 624, 144 would be my first mod. So that means this is now GCD and I move the 624 over and I put the remaining, okay? Now, 144 goes into that. I'll use my calculator. I don't need to do that in my head, even if I can. That's gonna go in four whole times. So my mod would be 624 minus four of these. which would be 48. Now, I like the next step because 48 goes into 144 exactly three times with zero remainder. And at this point, I can now answer the question and it is 48. Now, I'm pretty sure I did it right, but let me put a big but. What if I have an arithmetic error? So I'm using a calculator. What if I hit the wrong button? What if... Hmm, what if when I entered this, I entered 626 instead of 624? How do I know if I've actually got an arithmetic error somewhere? Well, that's actually the easiest part of the problem. I want to represent 1392 as 48 times something, and I want to represent 624 as 48 times something, because this is what you do in a low-level class. So 1392 is 48 times 29, and 6... 24 leaves a remainder of 13. And what's even better is 29 and 13. I recognize they're both prime numbers. So I mean, I did it perfectly. So if I said, factor this with the GCD, that would be the correct way of doing it. This is the simplest check. This is the answer. This is the check. You should always do the check. You don't have to show the check, but you should always do the check. There's always the possibility of an arithmetic error. That's why. Now, there's a lot of common factors and a lot of people confuse. A common factor and the greatest common factor are not necessarily the same thing. Every factor of 48, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, 16, 24, 48, every one of those factors is a common factor. But 48 is the biggest of those. So that's why that's the final answer. All right. Now we're going to move on. Now we're going to go through some things that are mostly definitions of not formulas, but really symbols that we use. So I want to start by redefining something we're all very familiar with, and that's what's called a sequence. Now, most calculus books give a simple definition of a sequence, but it's not always a really good definition. I was double checking some of my calculus books. Most calculus books define a sequence as a set. <clears throat> it's not a set. As soon as it says it's a set, then I don't trust anything the author says after that. It's not a set. It's an ordered list, which is not even similar to a set. And it is infinite. They usually forget to use those words. And they say with a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. That's usually the term they use. What does that mean? The natural numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. A one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers just simply means there's a first term, a second term, a third term, and so on. There's not a term 2.5. Okay, there's not a root tooth term. So a sequence we think of is something like this, A1, A2, A3, eventually AN, dot, dot, dot. Okay, we often think of them like this. Some people will use set bracket notation. That's actually quite incorrect. That they're, they're not even similar animals. And first of all, if I wrote the following, one, two, three, and I wrote three, two, one. And go, you can just say it out loud. Are these sets equal in, in terms of how we define equal sets? That, that's always confusing because we think of equal as being a numerical thing. Are these sets exactly the same? Are they equal? Yes, they are, because no order is implied. It would be equivalent to, to say, I'm going to write three names on a piece of paper, and you're going to be my new committee, and we're going to go out to lunch today. If I rearrange the three names on the piece of paper, that doesn't give me a different committee. It's the same three people. But if I write three names on a piece of paper, I said, okay, I'm gonna make the first person the president, the second person's going to be the treasurer, and the third person's going to go into the pit of despair. Okay, now the order you're written down uh, matters, you see. These sets are exactly the same because they contain the same elements. But if I said a sequence that starts 
one, two, three, and a sequence that starts three, two, one, are they the same? Absolutely not. In fact, they'll never have the same terms <laughs> other than the second term being two. No, no, no. So a sequence is an ordered list. And the most definitions in the textbooks I find to be too confusing. So I give my own definition. A sequence is an ordered list, okay, an ordered list with an underlying pattern, pattern, it's that simple. If I just wrote down numbers at random and said this this is infinite, there it can't be a sequence because it's not it's not possible to determine the rest of it. To be a sequence, there is a fixed set of things. By the way, a sequence doesn't necessarily have to be numbers, but we're going to work only with numbers for now. It's an infinite list. That's an ordered list. So the second term is the second term. You can't move it to somewhere else. And the underlying pattern means there must be a way. Either I have the whole list in front of me or there must be a way to determine what the numbers are. A sequence cannot be random, okay? That's not a possibility for a sequence. So when we talk about an underlying pattern, we're usually thinking of this guy right here. So I want you, if you go back into Calc 2, I know you guys all love sequences and series and stuff. No, no, it just means I've got something where I'm defining that term. We call it the nth or general term. So if I said, okay, I have a sequence and the nth term is gonna be n squared. I'm going to define this as my sequence. Then a1 would be 1, a2 would be 4, a3 would be 9, a4 would be 16, and so on. So my sequence would look like this, 1, 4, 9, 16. And we often put dot, dot, dot. If I've given you the underlying pattern, I don't really have to write any of the terms down. But what if I do it in reverse? What if I write down the first several terms of my sequence? And then you have to figure out the underlying pattern. Well, that's what you do in Calc 1. That's what you do in differential equations. That's a much harder process to try to figure out what the pattern is. That's not what we're interested in, in this course. In this course, we'll always be given the general underlying pattern and then ask questions about the sequence. You know, what's the 10th term? Well, 10 squared and so on. Now, there are several types of sequences that we study in depth. And your ability to analyze a sequence actually it involves a whole different branch of mathematics altogether. There's a simple rule of thumb, okay? If it's obvious, if you've, if you've discovered a clear and obvious pattern that would produce the next term, yet you don't have, you don't have the formula. But I've given you a list of numbers and it's really, really obvious. I mean, for example, here's my sequence, two, four, six, eight, 10. Anybody want to guess the next term? <laughs> It's probably not pi. It's probably not 37. You say, well, I'm pretty sure it's probably 12. Now, the question always remains, is it possible? I could have a mathematical formula that is so incredibly complicated that it produced these first five numbers, but the next number is not 12. Is that actually possible? Yes, it is. Is it plausible? No, it's not. Meaning, can't happen, period. Can't happen. This is where you go back to the philosophical term Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one. If you see a clear underlying pattern, that is the pattern. I, I've been doing this stuff my whole life. I've never run across a situation where the clear underlying pattern wasn't actually the pattern. It's always the pattern. So don't say, well, you know, I bet I could probably come up with some algorithm. It might take me a few years to come up with something that I produce these numbers and then probably not. Probably not going to be the case. That would be kind of complicated. So if you see a pattern, that's probably the pattern. Now, here's the part where we have difficulty. I have fun with this one because I want you to understand the big picture. We're, we're going to look at these from a different point of view than you do in calculus or differential equations. But the big picture is still the same in terms of, you know, what can I assume? What are my results? I want to consider the following sequence. This, this goes forever, but what I want you to do is fill in the next two terms. Now, everyone do this on your own for a moment. Tell, and, and what I want you to do is um, actually just chat me the next two terms. I want to see, I don't want you to yell it out. I don't want you to give it away, but this, is, this should take the only matter of seconds. So 
What are the next two terms of this? Okay, good. They're starting to come in. All right, good, 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 good. Although I'm seeing some strange ones. <laughs> yeah, pi and E probably aren't in there. Um, interesting. Okay, now I haven't seen the one I'm looking for yet though. Um, most of you are coming up with the same thing. Most of you so far have told me eight and 16. And that makes absolute sense, doesn't it? That makes perfect sense. You say, obviously I'm doubling to get to the next term. That's the, the funny thing is those weren't my next two terms. Those were my next two terms. What? I added one, I added two, I added three, I added four. There's a clear recognizable pattern right there, but so was that one. So you've just, with one example, proven something very, very important. In general, in general, you cannot always establish a pattern with fewer than four terms. That's actually the rule of thumb. If you went and did this at the graduate level, they tell you, you usually need. Now, if I said, here's my pattern, two, 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 <laughs> it's probably still two. One, two, three, okay, it's probably four, five, six. But I did something where there's two very clear patterns that could have been established. So what if I gave you the fourth number in this case? If I had given you a seven, everybody in this class would have said 11 is the next number. If I had given you the eight, everybody in the class would have said 16 is the next number and you would have all been correct. The problem was there was still a bit of ambiguity when I only had three. So a good rule of thumb is if a clear pattern has not been established, you need more terms, right? And so usually four is kind of the minimum. Now, remember, if I tell you what a n is, if I tell you what the general or nth term is, I don't really need to give you any because you can tell me all of them. But if I don't have a general term, then I actually have to have enough information to where there's not two clear possibilities. Now, that, that's kind of a tricky one, but that's OK. So that's what a sequence is. We're going to be working with these a little bit over the next couple of weeks. So now let's continue. Now we have the term series. Now, what is a series? Well, usually it goes hand in hand with a sequence. If a sequence was the ordered list of numbers, series is the sum of that ordered list of numbers. So if my sequence was A1, A2, dot, 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 you know, AN, dot, 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 forever and ever and ever, then the series would be, and we usually write it as big S, is the sum, I'll use n, n equal one to infinity of a n. Now, so in case you forgot what that notation means, that's the summation symbol. This is called the index or the counter, and counters always increment by one. So I'd start with n equal one, and that would give me a one. Added to, now I go to n equal two. Now I go to n equal three. When do I stop? I don't. It's an infinite list. Okay. Um, in, in remedial algebra, they'll use terms like infinite series. That's kind of on the same as when people say straight line. As if a line couldn't be straight, as if a series could. No, the word series means infinite sum. It, it doesn't, there's no such thing as a finite series. Now I can ask you for a finite portion of the series, that's different. But when you say series, that's in, when you say line, it is straight. <laughs> you don't have to throw in the straight part. So what if I only wanted the first 10 terms? What if I only want the first 25 terms? What if I want a finite collection of this series? What if I wanted n equal one to 10 of a n? That means I stop at that number. That means I never stop. Then the, the traditional notation is we write S 10. And this is called the 10th partial sum. 
So most of you hopefully remember those terms from your algebra classes. So this is the series. This is the sum of the first 10 terms of the series. Oh, okay, that makes it really easy because we're not gonna be working with infinite sums in this class because an infinite sum only has three possibilities. It's gonna add up to a finite number, it's gonna be infinite, or it diverges without limit. And that requires something else. That's what you did in Calc 2. We're not interested in that. We're interested in our ability to express a sum, a partial sum, and then add it up. Oh, okay. So we're technically really not working with series, we're working with summations. But I wanna throw in the term series so you remember where it comes from. So this is called a summation, not a series, or it's called a partial sum of a series. So I said, let's, let's do the following. I want from K equal, let's say one to four K cubed. If I wanted to do that, if I wanted to do that, what, what does this mean? Well, this would be one cubed plus two cubed plus three cubed plus four cubed. And now I would stop because I've actually reached the highest number. So then I would just add these up. One plus eight plus 27 plus 64. And that would be exactly 100. OK, great. Not that exciting. That's just what it is. Do I have to start at one? Hmm. Could I start somewhere else? Oh, heck, could I even start at a negative number? Yes, you're usually not going to see that, but technically, yes. So what if I do this? I want uh, i equal 3 to 8 of how about i squared? All that matters is that these match, OK? It doesn't matter what letter of the alphabet you use. My index is i, which means i is the key term here. So this would be 3 squared, because I'm starting at 3. Now, the counter doesn't have to start at 1, but the counter has to increment by 1. So then the next one would be 4 squared. And then 5 squared, 6 squared, 7 squared, 8 squared. And then I would give an answer if I can. So I've got 9 plus 16 plus 25 plus 36 plus 49 plus 64. Nothing clever. I just pull out my calculator. That's it. OK, that's it. All right, not very exciting. We're all very familiar with this kind of stuff and how it works. Just kind of a re-reminder. So now I'm going to introduce you to a symbol that you may not have used before. And let's do. Um, about um, now what is that well that's a capital pi okay we usually think of a small pi if you do it you know maybe you have like a little curvy tail but that's a capital pi that's a capital sigma capital sigma always means summation from in this case this number to this number capital pi hmm. summation s sum capital pi p Anybody want to try that one? What do you think it means? Addition. Oh, wait. Summation sum S. Pi P. Product. Product. <laughs> Good. Oh, don't make me have to give you more hints. OK, product. The capital Pi means product in exactly the same way the capital Sigma means sum. So that means this is 1 squared times two squared times three squared times four squared times five squared, okay? So, and so if I wanna do that, that's gonna be 14,400. So the, the capital pi is grow a little faster than the capital sigmas. So when you see a capital pi, that just means product. It's not weird, it's not complicated. It just means you're gonna take the product from one to five in this case. You're not going to have infinite products. That's, that's, you're never going to see that, OK? You're going to have a finite number of terms, but that's it. So this is notation you may not have seen. We're all very familiar with this notation. So I'm going to ask you questions. These are, these are fairly simple things. Just make sure do you understand what the definitions and the terminology means, OK? Sequences we're going to analyze. We're going to generate things later on. We're going to be able to prove things using sequences. So the last thing I wanted to go over today 
was certain notation that's going to become very commonplace throughout the course, and it's the notation of what we call combinations. Now, if you've had algebra, well, not so far away that you can't remember any of it, but you had algebra, you had statistics, you did combinations. Uh, in calculus, we do a very little, but it's only to derive formulas in Calc 1. We don't use them a whole lot. Um, you might do a little bit in Calc 2, but not as much. Okay. We, first of all, we, we all know what a factorial is. If I said n factorial, we know that means n, n minus 1, n minus 2, 3, 2, 1 for any positive integer n. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions on factorials. Factorials, the term factorial, you can't have a negative number in there. You can't have a, a fraction in there. The, the n has to be a non-negative integer. Well, what, then what about zero? Well, it doesn't end at zero. Otherwise, all factorials would equal zero. Now, the factorial comes from something called the gamma function. Um, if you've had math 255, then you did gamma function. Gamma function is one of the gnarliest improper integrals. It's an improper integral because you have an infinite limit of integration and you have to use integration by parts. It's, it's crazy cool though. The gamma function of x plus one equals x times the gamma function of x. This is something you prove in, in differential equations. That means then if x is a non-negative integer, then you can prove that you're going to get as a result factorial. So the factorial comes from a gamma function where your input is a non-negative integer, but in the gamma function, you can actually put in things that are not integers. So that's a separate thing. So factorial is a special case and it's a really, really important thing. But the other reason that's important is because you prove that zero factorial is one. Most people think that's a definition and in lower level math, it's fine. If we just say, hey, we're gonna define zero factorial to be one because to actually see the calculation would require that you're in a math 255 course. It's a gnarly thing, but zero factorial is calculated to be one, not defined to be one. But because of that calculation, it makes a lot of things simpler. So if we said you have N distinct objects and you're going to choose r of them then clearly r must be less than or equal to n i have n distinct objects i have n different books on my shelf this distinct is important if i said i have n ping pong balls well if i rearrange the ping pong balls you wouldn't know it would still look like the same arrangement so if i have n distinct objects and i'm going to choose r of them the number of ways i can do that is n choose r so we say n choose r and this is the notation that's not a quotient that's a combination and again from previous classes we know it's this n factorial over the quantity n minus r factorial times r factorial. If I am going to arrange them and put them in order, that's something else. That's called a permutation. And if that were a permutation, then you'd say there's r factorial arrangements. So I'd multiply this by r factorial, they'd cancel. We're not doing that problem. We're doing this problem here. So combinations, which are far more common. So you can use these to do things, you know, if you like to play poker, how many different poker hands are there? Or how many different ways of, you know, how many different lottery outcomes are there? there there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, from our class, I want to form a basketball team. So how many ways can I pick five people from our class? Okay, so 40 choose five and so on. So whenever you say it that way, combination 40 choose five, that means it's this type of notation. And the numbers are going to be large in general because they're factorials. Now, a couple of years back, um, for a while, I taught the math portion of the GRE test at San Diego State. Um, it would be roughly like 12 Saturdays out of the year. So you're going to take the GRE. That's like the SATs for grad school. You're going to take the GRE, it's math and English. And then if you're going to go on, you might have a higher one. So if you're a STEM person, everybody takes the lower level one, and then you might take a subject specific one. So the lower level one is math and English. The math is algebra, geometry, and statistics. Okay. And so what I would do is I'd have a class, usually about 40, 45 people. It would be nine to three on a Saturday. 
And then a four week session, two of the sessions would be English, two would be math, and they just sort of alternate. Sometimes math might be first and second, it might be second and fourth, it might be first and third, it'd be different each, each time. And you could take the class as many times as you want. It was not cheap, but it was really well done. And there was all sorts of workbooks. So anyway, we do this, but I would review the statistics and I'd point out to the people, you don't have a calculator. Now, when you're taking the test, you're doing the whole thing online on a computer screen. So there is a little calculator on the screen. It adds, subtracts, multiplies, divides, has no order of operations, no exponent key, no square root key. So if you want to do three plus five times seven, you're going to get the wrong answer because there's no order of operations. So in other words, it's for adding two numbers. It's for multiplying two numbers. And that's about it. So they had to do combinations and factorials and things like that without a calculator. So how the heck did they do that? Well, I showed them how to manipulate things. So for example, they might have to do something as simple as this. They've got to go six, choose three without the ability to use a calculator to do this. So what is this? This is six factorial over six minus three and then three. Now those two numbers always add up to that because it's N minus R and it's R. Now, I still need to do this. I don't want to calculate six factorial. That's too much work. So what you do is you write like this. I remind people, n factorial is equal to n times that. Why? Because if 10 factorial is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, isn't that 10 times 9 factorial? And isn't that 10 times 9 times 8 factorial and so on and so on and so on? You can always manipulate a factorial by just representing the rest of the factorial because 3, 2, 1. Now, why would I do such a crazy thing? Because then I could cancel. Because remember, that's a product in the denominator. Uh, okay, now three factorial. That's three times two times one. Three times two times one is just six. I really haven't done anything yet. And now I can say my answer is 20, five times four. So this is how you manipulate combinations when you don't have a calculator. You know, that's it's how you have to do it. Now, what if, you know, I'm not good at multiplying those two. Well, that's what the calculator on the screen would allow you to do. It'd allow you to multiply five times four. It just won't allow you to input a six factorial, okay? So what we want to do is a little bit of manipulation because we are going to derive factorial formulas as the course goes on just to get used to doing certain things. So for example, if I said, can we evaluate or simplify? And that is really the same thing. Can you evaluate, how about, um, let's, let's keep it simple. Um, N minus one, choose R minus one. I want to evaluate this. So that means I want to write my final answer as a factorial, okay? Or at least as a product of numbers. But if I can do it without a quotient, now here's one of the beautiful things about factorials. Okay. We know a factorial is always going to be an integer. We know a combination, which is a quotient of factorials, will also always be an integer, which means no matter what the question is, your denominator is going to cancel because it's going to be part of the numerator. Anytime you're asked a combination, n choose r, you're going to get an integer answer. Okay. No matter what, things will cancel. I didn't give you numbers. Hmm. So my numerator, which is n minus 1 factorial, my denominator is, now off to the side, n minus 1 minus r minus 1. That's my first term. So that'd be n minus 1 minus r plus 1 or n minus r. Now what's left? Well, n minus r, what do I have to add to that? Well, let's see. If I now said n minus 1 minus, well, I'm going to get the r minus 1. Okay, which is bigger, n minus r or n r minus one? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. So what I would want to do is 
expand enough terms to where I can cancel something. So how do I do that? Well, I just, if I had numbers up there, if I had a 10 factorial, you could write 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 times 4 factorial. Well, let's write this. And so I can't really do anything with that guy. So let's work with that guy. Okay. And by the way, R has to be greater than or equal to one because you can't have a negative in here. Could R equal one technically? Could I choose zero? Yeah, here's how you do it. There's 40 people in this class. If I said I want to form the five person basketball team, you'd say that's 40 choose five, which by the way, if I use my calculator, 40 choose five, which looks like that, it's that simple. 40 choose five would be 658,008. What if I said, I only want to pick one person? How many ways could I do that? 40, pick the one person. I decided I don't want to pick any of you. How many ways could I not pick any of you? One, not to pick any of you. <laughs> There's only one way not to pick any of you and that's don't pick any of you. That would be 40 choose zero, which means I'd have a zero factorial in my calculation. Ah, so one of the things right off the bat, by the way, n choose r is also equal to n choose n minus r because the number of ways of choosing r is equivalent to the number of ways of choosing which of the rest you're going to leave behind. So if I'm choosing r things that I'm leaving behind n minus r things. So choosing r or choosing n minus r, it's the same numerical calculation because they both have the same denominators. So in this case here, what I need to do is whittle down my numerator. So I'm going to write my numerators n minus one times n minus two. Let's assume r is bigger than one. You know, r, r is at least you know two, three, four, five, six. Seven. It's not one because that would make it kind of boring, right? N minus three. How far down do I go? How about n minus r plus one? I'm decreasing by one. So then, what's the very next one I'd have? It'd be n minus r. So if n is large, right, maybe, uh, you know, 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, whatever, and now I'm down to whatever that one was, that's my numerator. Okay, so now what? Well, now, I no longer have a factorial in my numerator, but I'm going to write my numerator n minus one, n minus two. And if you want to just go like that, that's okay. But I have that. My denominator is r minus one factorial. Now I really, in this case here, I can't go any further because I, I need to know the value of r. I can't calculate that without knowing what r is. So I'm going to stop here, but notice I canceled one of my factorials. When I did the six factorial over three, factorial, three factorial, one of the first things I was able to do was cancel one of the factorials. So this is simply an exercise in manipulating factorials. That's all it is. There's nothing about the final answer that's extremely important. It's the process of manipulation to get there. Okay. So I'm going to stop here in terms of the lecture material. Now I want to talk about the test a little bit, some of the logistics. When we're done with that, then we'll take a break and go to office hours. So now the test is Wednesday morning, eight o'clock class time. You're going to, you know, it's going to feel like you're going to a class, except that you're going to be taking a test. I will be emailing you the exams Wednesday morning, about 10 to 15 minutes before the exam. And you have two options. One is you can print the exam if you have a printer. And if you have a printer, you definitely want to print the exam. Otherwise, you got to write questions down. The second option is you don't have a printer. That means you're going to, you know, write on a blank piece of paper, one, two, three, four, five. I don't need you to write down the, the complete instruction to the problem because you can do a split screen. You can have the exam on your screen while you're taking the test. The reason I don't like that personally, because that means you have to stare at the computer screen for the entire duration of the test. So personally, eh, that's hard on my eyes. I would rather look at a piece of paper and write on it than stare at the screen before I do every single problem. But that's, you know, that's what you're going to have to do in that case. So I'm going to send it to you a few minutes early so you can figure out, you know, you can print it and do everything. Plus, Mesa right now has been having some definite email problems. I'm, I'm sending class emails almost every day, and I'm getting all these mail system delivery errors that one or two people aren't getting my emails. 
This, this is a Mesa problem. This is not your problem. This is, and they, this happened last summer and they, they fixed it and it hasn't happened since. But I noticed in the last three days, I've probably gotten 30 or 40 of these system delivery errors, which means I don't know if people are getting all the emails. So I'm going to email you that. Then you're going to log on to Zoom. <clears throat> camera on. I've actually gotten two emails today. Oh, by the way, I don't have a camera. So I'm going to take the test off camera. Oh, that's, that's unfortunate because that would be a zero. You don't have the option of taking the test off camera. That would be an unproctored exam. You've known since the first day of class that you're taking the tests and camera. So finding out the day of the test that you don't have. I gave an exam on Thursday and I had a student on Thursday. Okay. You have to understand how bad this looks from my point of view. They log on to Zoom and I never see their face. I said, Turn your camera on. Oh, I don't have a webcam. And you're telling this the day of the exam. Yeah, so I'm not gonna take it on camera. I said, do you have a cell phone? We're doing this through chat. He says, yes. I said, then just use your cell phone as your camera. <laughs> and his response was, I, I don't know how to get on the Zoom. Now, mind you, we're on Zoom having this conversation. And he actually said, I don't know how to get on Zoom. So he took a two hour test off camera. He actually got a zero on the test, by the way. This person actually missed in a two hour calculus test every single part of every single question, but I'd already told him this test isn't gonna count anyway. The fact that he says, I don't know how to get on Zoom while he's actually on Zoom doesn't really surprise me that he couldn't answer any of the calculus questions. Yeah, I, I don't wanna know that you're having issues with a camera when it's time to take the test. Fix it. You have a cell phone. It's not the best, but you have a cell phone. You stick it in front of you and you take the test on your cell phone. Okay. It's not really that complicated. Computer screen's easier. All right. So you're going to have the test. I always pad the time a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. The class is 85 minutes. So I always give a few extra minutes. That's, I, I don't really have a problem with extra minutes because I don't like people to grace period. Time. Is it like a grace period? A grace period? Yeah, like a five minute grace period. Oh, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. You know, if we were at, if we were on campus, here, here's what I do. If you've ever been in one of my three unit classes, and many of you have, three unit classes are the worst because that means there's a class right before you and a class right after you, and there's only a small gap. So what I would always do on test day, I'd say everyone get to class, don't interfere with the other class, but the moment those folks start leaving, get in there and sit down and then we'll start the test. Now, when the test is over, there's another class ready to come in, but they're going to wait till you leave. So we'll sometimes linger a couple extra minutes. We're not going to go into their time. Yeah, but we can linger a couple minutes each way. In this environment, we don't have people trying to get on and stuff. I do have another class after. So I don't mind padding a few minutes because that's I want everybody to be focused and comfortable. Most of you will finish well under the time anyway, because you're not calculating anything. So that's not really the issue. So again, I'm going to email you the test. You're going to take the entire test from beginning to end on Zoom, and you're going to send it back to me the same way, hopefully, that you're sending quizzes. Now, I'm still having some folks have tremendous issues with this. Okay, The Fast Scanner app, which I've required since before the first day of class, it's the easiest thing on planet Earth, and those who use it understand this. You go click, 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 send. From beginning to end, it can't take 30 seconds to send me your entire exam. Do not send me multiple PDFs. Send me one PDF with all the pages. You click first page, click second page. Preferably, please put your pages in the same orientation. Because when you send me one PDF with all the pages and some of them are sideways and some are upside down, it's real headache to rotate and manipulate because then I have to download each part of it. Yeah, just send them all in the same order. Now, take the pictures in good light. On this most recent quiz, some of you guys took your pictures in the closet, it looks like. I mean, it is really, really dark. And that's not from the contrast. There just wasn't very much light in your room. So make sure the light is good and also no shadows going across the page. Please use black ink because pencil does not translate well when you're taking pictures, okay? That's it, and white paper. When you're using grid and bold lines, sometimes that's darker than your writing. I don't care, if you're doing this on blank paper, I don't care how many pieces of paper you use, that's, that's fine. The test itself, I've got the problems spread out so you can easily fit the answers on the pages themselves. So if you print the page, Okay, then you can do the entire problem on the printed exam. Quizzes, I just give you the questions and I say do everything on separate paper. For the exam, I've actually given you plenty of room on each problem to write the entire problem there. 
That's why if you print the exam, that's the easiest way for you to go about doing it. Can you send me the pages back, preferably in order, <laughs> okay? Using the fast scanner app, there's always people who they still want to do things their way and I get them, I can't rotate them, I can't enlarge them, and often I can't even open them up and they're not even a PDF. Yeah, take the picture, don't download it to your computer first. No, just take the picture and send. It is so ridiculously easy and that's it and then we're done. There's no lecture that day because the entire class is the exam. If we were on campus, it'd be the exact same thing. Now, what can you bring? Well, you certainly don't need a calculator for this one, but in terms of are there formulas, are there definitions and things? All classes calculus and above that I teach, I have a simple rule. You can bring a three by five card and you can use both sides. So no, no matter how many times I say that, people say, well, you only said one side. Both sides, any theorem, formula or definition that we have come up with in this class. And in this class, we've got a lot of definitions and we've got a lot of theorems that you think will aid you in proceeding the test. You do not have to. But I find that um, if you take the time and trouble to write down things that you felt were important, not examples, but, but theorems and definitions and things, if you take the time to write things down, then you've reinforced them. And I'll give you an example. In the textbook here, I don't expect you to memorize things. I expect you to understand and use things. But in section 2.1, for example, let me find it. We're, we're doing the, I don't know what page it's on. Ah, we're doing the logical equivalences. Boom. So when you're doing a set and I say, you know, justify each step and you say, oh, that's just, you know, the associative property. That's just the identity law. That's the negation law. Great. But unless you know all those off the top of your head, I would, I would write these down on a formula card. <laughs> That's the negation law, right? That's the, the De Morgan's law, things like that. Yeah, you got to know that. Um, do you know what a conditional, a contrapositive, an inverse, and negation are going to look like if I give you a statement? Because those are the questions I'm going to ask. Now, there's nothing to write down if it's a truth table. You just fill in the T's and the F's. Yeah, that's, that's an easy thing, okay? But if it's if there's vocab that you are not familiar with, then think definition. You can write down a definition. What you can't give yourself is a how-to instruction manual on something. No, that's open book at that point. This is not an open book test, but because there are theorems and definitions that we've recently learned, I don't care if you've memorized them or not. I want you to have them right at your fingertips. So you are allowed to write them down on a three by five card. It's unlikely you're gonna really fill it up. So what will happen is when the test starts, I'm going to say, show me your card. You're just going to hold it up to your screen and flip it over. Okay. The reason I do that is I'm giving a calculus test today. They're not allowed, a Calc 2 test. They're not allowed to bring any of their Calc 1 formulas. That's what they're supposed to know. And that's what most people are going to write down. And I'm going to say, hold up your formulas. And when I see nothing but Calc 1 formulas, I'm going to tell them, no, you can't use that card because I made it clear what you could and couldn't use. And that's something you can't use. So don't put down examples and what, you know, how to do that problem with those words. That's not going to be useful. You want to write down the theorems and the definitions because then it will translate to any problem that can ask. Um, on every test, I throw an extra credit problem. The extra credit is an over and above challenge from the material you're being tested on. It's not coming from somewhere else. And I throw that on there because most everybody in here will miss a problem that they know well. I mean, everybody is good at something. A lot of you are good at everything. And some of you might have been, you know, tutoring somebody before the class how to do a truth table properly. And now they're going to get it right. And when you did the test, you saw something completely different and you completely tank that problem. This happens to almost everybody that they tank one that they absolutely know. So the extra credit is kind of like a buyback. It's to get that one back. So that at the end of a test, I don't care what your score is. I only care that your score is a true reflection of what you know. If you know the material in an A level, then a B test is not a good test. If you know the material at a B level, then a B test is a fantastic test because it means you were able to show everything you knew. So that's the thing is I want the score to be reflective of what you know. Now, unlike a calculus test or any other algebra test, you're not going to have a lots of careless arithmetic errors because there's not any arithmetic. So that part's easy. The only arithmetic is the div and mod stuff that we just did. And that's that's pretty 
That's pretty simple stuff. That, that's not stuff that people are going to make algebra errors on. Okay. So we'll, then, we'll take a short break right now. Oops, my, I froze there for a second. Let's take a short